The Lord be with you. We gather here for Vespers, again, in unusual circumstances, but we pray that our Lord would bless this time as we hear his holy word in his gospel. We sing the hymn.
shall teach them. Their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. sing the office hymn.
reading from 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite, with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes, and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you, shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. A reading from 1 John, the first chapter. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life of was made manifest, and we have, we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things, so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. O Lord, have mercy on us. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my
Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have seen how God delivers personally the salvation won at Calvary to us in holy baptism. The one true God makes known his holy will in the Ten Commandments, declares his salvation in his Son and by his Holy Spirit, as we are shown in the Creed, and shows us the way of holy living in the Lord's Prayer. In holy baptism, we receive all the blessings of forgiveness and salvation. We are children of God and live holy lives, daily repenting and dying to our sinful nature and daily rising to new life. It is the repenting part that is the hard part. It is confessing our sin and turning from sin that our sinful nature daily rises up against. Thus we see that there is no other God who could act in such a way as the Holy Triune God does. Repentance is not simply being sorry for your sins. It's certainly not saying you're sorry, but with the intent that you will just do the same sin again. It's also not a morose, gloomy outlook on life and your life in particular. Repenting of and confessing your sin does mean you are always, sorry, does not mean that you are always down on yourself as such a horrible sinner and that your life is worthless. The only God who is the true God and the only one who can actually save you is the one who loves you enough to call you to repentance and to despair of yourself, and any notion you might have that you are fine without him. So the Apostle John says in our second reading, that if we say we have no sin, we we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Are you aware of your sin? What are the sins that you carry out? Do you recognize the sinfulness of your condition? What is in your heart? and mind? Do you consider your sinfulness to be just a problem that is to be overcome? If you had the ability to go for a period of time without sinning, would you think that you are in good shape? Do not deceive yourself. You are sinful. You sin, and most of us us are aware of that. Those who think that they do not sin at all, should spend some time reading the Bible to see that there is no human being who has ever not sinned, except for our Lord, of course. But those who take seriously our Lord's call to repentance recognize that we do sin and are powerless to overcome temptation by our own will and ability. Here is the great offense to the world and to our own sinful nature, We are completely sinful. Even if we did not commit actual sins, we would still be corrupt in our entire being. Don't deceive yourself into thinking that your sins are not that bad. Don't fool yourself into believing that you have a problem that can be overcome. You are by nature sinful and unclean. Confession and absolution is an extension of living in your baptism. Daily, you confess your sins and ask for forgiveness. Daily, you emerge to a new and risen life. But what about those sins that trouble you? What about those sins that no one knows about? You know you're forgiven, but you are left with your own thoughts and may have your own doubts. Individual confession and absolution was instituted by Jesus as the personal extension of holy baptism. In holy baptism, the Holy Spirit delivered to you personally forgiveness and salvation. In individual confession, the Holy Spirit delivers to you personally the forgiveness of sins that you confess. In John 20, we are told of the risen Lord. When he sees his disciples, who he is commissioning to be his apostles, he breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. He says to them, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. 
Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you do not forgive, they are not forgiven. Jesus has instituted baptism. He has instituted his Holy Supper. He gives us a third sacrament, the personal declaration of the forgiveness of your sins. Now, our natural inclination might be to balk at this. Why do you need to go to a pastor to confess your sins? And why must you hear from him that your sins are forgiven? Indeed, there are some who are even offended at this. Is the pastor somehow on a higher plane than everyone else? That he can forgive people's sins and that they can't just be forgiven by praying to God and believing that they are forgiven? Now, there is nothing new here. And that is not to dismiss the objections. It is to put them in perspective. People have always held to the belief that they can have a spiritual relationship with God that is just between them and God. I do not need to go through an intercessor. I can go directly to Jesus. And that is true, as we have said. You can and ought to pray and confess all the time and believe that you are forgiven. When Jesus was on earth, what did many people think? Who are you to place yourself in authority over me? Who are you to declare forgiveness of sins? No one can forgive sins but God. Even when God himself was on earth, people were offended that a human being placed himself in authority over others by declaring to people that they were forgiven. How much more will people take issue when it is men who are not God, but in their call as a pastor are saying, I forgive you all your sins. To be clear, every Christian ought to forgive the sins of those who have sinned against them. But what Jesus is commanding on the day he rose from the grave is that his apostles forgive people's sins who are repentant. By extension, this command is to pastors, as the apostles designated pastors to preach and to teach and to absolve sins in the various cities and places where Christian congregations were established. This is no different than Christ commanding his apostles to baptize and to administer the Lord's Supper, and that authority and call being given to pastors to do the same. In every place these gifts are given, so that God's people may be forgiven their sins and strengthened in their faith. It is not just the law of God that is offensive, that we are sinful in need of salvation. It is also the gospel. We preach Christ crucified, says the Apostle Paul, an offense to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. So there is nothing new here. Those who are offended at a pastor forgiving others their sins are not offended at the pastor, but at Christ himself. Now, pastors dare not abuse this authority. They are under strict authority by Christ himself, never to divulge the sins confessed to them. They are under strict orders by the Lord himself to be compassionate with those who come to their pastor to confess their sins, to hear their confession with sympathy and understanding, and to counsel them in the word of God with comfort and strength. There is the other part, the withholding of forgiveness. Those who are unrepentant, they are not to receive the forgiveness of sins. They are to be counseled in the word of God that their soul is in danger. This also ought to be done in compassion and un understanding, but in all forthrightness. How does a pastor know if a person is unrepentant? Certainly not by peering into the person's heart. First, that is impossible. Second, the pastor is not to interrogate the person who is coming to confess their sins. The pastor is not an inquisitor. He is there to speak God's word, to exhort the person to repentance, to comfort them 
with the blessed forgiveness of their sins. The only way to know if a person is unrepentant is by seeing that the person refuses to turn from their sin and continue to live in their sin. The pastor is the called and ordained servant of Christ. He is a sinner himself. He needs the very same forgiveness as those who confess their sins to him. He ought himself to confess his sins to a brother pastor so that he too may hear and receive the forgiveness of his sins. He then is able to have an overwhelming sense of compassion for his fellow sinners who are struggling with sin, who are distraught over their feebleness to constrain their sin, who are in need of the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for the sin of the world. No other God has brought about salvation in this way. He has given baptism for the bringing of the salvation accomplished to people personally. He gives the invitation to confess their sins. The promise, as the Apostle John says, is that if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No other God can save in this way. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus. Amen. We sing the canticle. Please stand. Let my prayer rise before you as incense.
Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, give us grace to trust you during this time of illness and distress. In mercy, put an end to the pandemic that afflicts us. Grant relief to those who suffer and comfort all that mourn. Sustain all medical personnel in their labors and cause your people ever to serve you in righteousness and holiness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. O oh Lord, our dwelling place and our peace, you have compassion on our weakness. Put far away from us all worry and fearfulness, that having confessed our sins and commending ourselves to your gracious mercy, we may, when night shall come, commit ourselves, our work, and all that we love into your keeping, receiving you, from you, the gift of quiet sleep, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We sing the hymn.
pray the Lord's richest blessings upon you. We again pray that the Lord would bless this time as we are worshiping under very unusual circumstances, but we do give thanks that to God that his word is always with us, always with us, and we always have the opportunity to pray. I pray the Lord's richest blessings to you. Go in peace.